All right, uh, you are watching Wall of Power TV on the road. I'm your host, Paul Metza. I couldn't be more delighted to have my old buddy, Louis Perez, who's in town tonight playing with his band, Los Lobos. You might have heard of him. Louis was uh, one of the founding members. And uh, so he was kind enough to take time out of his busy schedule before the sound check to talk to us uh, at the legendary St. Paul Hotel. Louis, so good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. It's been a while. Oh, it's been a while. Well, yeah. you, you guys are celebrating 45 years. 45 years, yeah. We're in our 45th year. It'll be 40, we'll start the 46th year in um, November. It's always that kind of weird thing. When 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 is it over? You know. Right, right. I I, I believe that if it if it's if you're forty five years old, you're forty five years old all the way until yeah. you're forty six. Yeah, that's right. right. So that's right. what I say. Other people argue it. <laughs> so and here we are. I uh, years later. Boy, time flies. How many gigs does that represent? How many what? How many gigs as Los Lobos? Wow. Good question. That is a good question. Well, they never had a Saturday day off in, in 45 years, that alone. <laughs> right. You'd start there. I don't know. A lot of damn gigs. A lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Louis, I saw the first Los Lobos show at the 7th Street entry, and I believe 1982, maybe 83. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. It was probably the first uh, trip through the city. So, um, I was there yeah, with the 30 of my close friends. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Sold out house. Yeah. yeah. In a closet called the, the um, Center Street Entry. Yeah. That's right. Attached. It's kind of attached to. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's yeah. right next to First Avenue. First Avenue. Just a, a couple doors. Uh, we moved it up one. later to the big stage. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw those shows too. Yeah. Black but uh, show. you had another up and coming band open that show at mm -hmm. 7th Street. Called Soul Asylum. Soul Asylum, yeah. Some people have heard of them too. Then you played, yeah, First Avenue, not long after that. So you guys have had such really an amazing career, thousands of gigs, over 20 records. You've all done your solo projects. And let's say right at the top here, you've got a new book out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 it's called Good Morning Aslan. Uh, Named after one of the songs I wrote, and it's really what it is. It's it's uh, it's funny people say I can hardly wait to read your book. Well, it's not really a book to read. It's something to experience because it, there's a hundred song lyrics. There's kind of bits and pieces of some poetry, some little mini stories, a bunch of art, um, and there's a, a interview with with me and David Greenberger from the Duplex Planet. I know David. And then uh, then there's. Uh, Essays about how groovy a guy I am. <laughs> how embarrassing, but it's kind of like a career retrospective. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like a like a really cool scrapbook. Yeah, that you yeah, can share yeah, with right. people. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm I can't wait to read it. Let's talk about it's you on get, Amazon, so you can. Okay. It, yeah. um, let's talk about you guys coming up uh, from East LA through the LA punk scene, really, That's which right, is yeah. tell us about that. Those times with the Blasters, yeah. another American roots band. You don't think you would associate Los Lobos or the Blasters with the punk scene, but so tell us about it. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, um, during that whole punk rock scene that was happening in, in, in L.A., of course, it was kind of a gestation place for a lot of bands. Mm -hmm. So uh, an outlet for that was Rockabilly. Right. And so the Blasters kind of fit in there because they played jump blues and patrol stuff. Right. And. Uh, so there was a lot of different factions within mm -hmm. that after a while. It wasn't all just hardcore punk rock, but everybody still kind of all hung together. Right. That was an really incredible t period, by the way. You know, I, right. I, uh, I think about it all the time. I talk about it. I wrote about it. As a matter of fact, I wrote a, uh, one of the essays in John Doe's and Tom DeSavia's book called Under the... Uh, the first one was called Under the Big Black Sun, mm -hmm. the first sex book. The new one that just came out a few weeks ago, no, now it's been a month, is called uh, More Fun in the New World. Okay. And it's a bunch of essays, and so uh, yeah, I've got one in there. Again, talking about this incredible time. Uh, rolling back now, uh, when we first started, we, we've had some a really interesting career. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, when we first started, we were, we were friends in high school playing in, in, uh, in rock bands. You and David? David and I had a garage band. Caesar had a more of a top 40-ish band. Mm -hmm. They modeled themselves after like Tower of Power, Chicago, the horns a little bit. 
Conrad had a power trio that was kind of like blue cheer. Okay. You know, louder than everything else. Right. Uh, he lived a few blocks away, and I hear him all the time. Right. You know? Were you guys uh, at, was the same high school, just same same area? Same high school. Really? Same high school, yeah. Even though our neighborhoods were, were separated separated by um, by a freeway. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in uh, with Conrad in his neighborhood, about a few blocks away, in Conrad, and uh, Caesar um, was in. Um, Another neighborhood, not not all that close close either, miles away, and uh, him and David uh, lived uh, a few blocks away. How big was the high school? High school was pretty big because okay. it, it was a real famous high school called James A. Garfield High School. Okay. They made a movie about it called Stand and Deliver. We became friends first, and I think that's what what is key to the longevity of the right. band because we were friends before we ever you know we didn't. Put out a classified ad at the supermarket for right. for a bass player. Right. We, we actually grew up together. Wanted well, bass player with looks. <laughs> <laughs> with lo locks and looks. Yeah, locks and looks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we were buddies, and then what happened was after um, um, we graduated from high school, I Conrad graduated first. He's the oldest guy. Then I came me. And we we're both the oldest. Then came Caesar and, and David. So we. Once everybody was graduated from high school, we just kind of hung around like we always did. Right. Know? But except this way, we didn't have to go to school anymore. Right. So, so it was just uh, hanging out. Um, we'd go over to like Caesar's house and we'd sit around and play guitars and we'd do that sort of thing. Uh, so what happens, you, okay, we still have our bands. Sure. Right. But that funny thing happens that, like, you know, um, how, how does the story go? If you hang around at a barbershop long enough, you'll eventually get a haircut. Yeah, well, we started get a, clipped. We started a band. Yeah, right. Because we were just hanging around together. And so uh, uh, the band came together in a very uh, a peculiar way. Uh, we're rock and roll kids, but we grew up uh, with Mexican music in sure. the background. That was our parents' music. So one day we decided... And I forget which mom was having a birthday. We were going to do a serenade. You know, it's, 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 it's a real um, traditional thing to do in mm -hmm. Mexican culture. Uh, and it happens in the early morning. So we said, let's learn one of those songs. Right. And for us, we said, hey, yeah, it's you know, just whatever. You sure, one of those whole things, yeah. We sat down to try to learn one of those songs, and we, we realized how hard it was. <laughs> right. And at that point, we realized that, that this is really, it, uh, uh, there's really great musicianship. Back then, how many great guitar players in the world? Five? Yeah. Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix. And here Mike was... Bloomfield. Yeah, yeah. But one of my favorites. He's yeah. Me, eats me sweats. My oh, favorite my record. God. Uh, so, um, we didn't... Once once we heard oh, the, those and, records... And a guy named Carlos Santana. Carlos Santana. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, okay, we're going to take up the whole... Uh, the I know. Hour talking about what, making the list. Uh, yeah. But we realized that these some of these guys that were playing on these records were just as good or better. I mean, some lightning fast solos on some. Sure. Then, then, we, then we realized that there was more than just mariachi music. Right. And so by then we were like way deep in it. Right. And we started learning the stuff, and we still had our bands. And then we finally made the decision, which was real bold, is to give up our 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 rock bands. And devote all our time to this, which wow. is completely unheard of. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of like a, like somebody to, um, uh, in min, uh, in Minnesota taking up uh, the accordion and playing Norwegian folk music. Right. You know, just like and being like 17 years old. It's, right. Yeah, you know, come on, nobody does that. So right. it's parents' music. But we did that, and we stuck to it, and uh, we did it for years and years until finally got to the point where we actually had to like you know make a living so we, we ended up doing like playing in like Mexican restaurants it is right all, all the is there any the pictures of that yeah there is oh I'd love to see There's that some hilarious pictures of us uh, and it was just it was just dread, dreadful time you, your but, bio said that between 74 and 80 you guys mostly just played weddings and that's right. house parties yeah and which that was, was that part was okay uh, but but toward the end of of, of, um, of the 70s we, by then we had like families and stuff, you know. I right. mean, we're talking about we're, we're already like in our twenties or, or, or a little younger than that, and uh, uh, so we needed an income. So we we had to find a regular gig, and, and it was like these dreadful jobs right. in Mexican restaurants, playing like you know typical stuff. It was awful, right. but of course um, it spawned something. Right. It, you know, about a boredom 
uh, we started goof fooling around. Okay. Eventually, we got fired for playing Wild Thing too loud. Because <laughs> you started to plug into this guy's rig that was set up because he played like in the evening. Right, right, He right. did like this thing with an amp and an you know, electronic drum thing. And, and so we plugged into it and we started bringing our own stuff in. And finally, we, we got too loud and we, it's not what the owner wanted. Right. So we got canned. But we ended up back in the garage. And during that, it, um, it kind of happened parallel to that. Was that we were, we were uh, we had discovered like the blasters and and punk rock because I just right. like the energy you know right so David myself and a friend Eddie he had the car so we used to go to, to the Hollywood and check out like the plugs and germs yeah. and a bunch of bands and I just loved the energy right I never thought that oh, well you know, that's not what we do but right. you know, it's kind of cool uh, then the blasters came up and then we said wow wait a second now that there's this other kind of faction within the, the the punk rock sphere mm -hmm. of stuff that was happening. We said maybe we can, we can. There's something. So we met the Blasters and we gave them a, a cassette. Remember those? Oh yeah. And they said, wow, wow, cool, you know. Uh, and and the, when we first introduced, we were from we're a little slower from East LA. We we're like from East LA too. We're, wow. They're Southeast LA and Downey. So we hit it off. They uh, they had us open up a show at the Whiskey a Go Go, in front of one of the packed houses, and that was it. Wow, we we uh, we we were we were in. So, so uh, that was our Louis, what year, what year was that? That 80? was 19, 1981. Wow, eighty two, right around that. It wow. happened pretty quick yeah. after that. Um, and that's 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 the story. That's how, that's how it went. And uh, then we started getting notoriety. People started writing. Yeah, the typical thing that used to happen. Right, that doesn't happen anymore. Well, one of the reasons why the very similar thing was going on in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was. I was hanging on the West Bank, with like, uh, you know, listening to Willie Murphy and Kern Rand Glover, and I was playing my folk and blues thing and starting to write tunes. But I lived in South Minneapolis where the whole punk rock thing was exploding. Yeah. So I'd go down to First Avenue or 7th Street and you'd hear the replacements and Who's Could Do. Yeah, and oh man. Soul is Slouch. Yeah, so it was a very exactly. similar thing, but I think yeah. the one thing that was happening back then in both Los Angeles and here was people were writing about it. Yes. Right? Yeah, so yeah. you had the you know you had the village voice and New York here you had it was called Sweet Potato and then City Pages. And yeah. then uh, we you had, had, we had the, the LA Weekly. Weekly the right? LA Weekly. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, it was called the LA Reader. Yeah. That's what Chris Morris wrote for that. And the LA Times, you know, they, they had some really kind of interesting guys. Um, Don Snowden, um, Christine McKenna that which went on to, to write art for the for the Times. But they're all out there, you know, yeah. listening to music and writing about it. It was real cool. It, it's like what used to happen, how, right. how it used to work, which was, wasn't rocket science. Right. It was easy to do. Right. You know, people write about a band, the band puts out a record, the record companies support that, they have local journalists right. write about it when you come to town, people who like the show, they go to the stores and buy the record. Right. Down. Yeah, right. Real, real easy. simple. Yeah, it doesn't happen anymore. So... And that's what happened with us. Yeah. yeah. Except... except uh, a, a real, well, we learned real quick. Don't put a record out in the in the fall, because we, we found ourselves driving down like Iowa cornfields in the right. winter time, <laughs> right. Minneapolis in the in the winter. Right. You know, yeah. Nor Nor <laughs> Norway. Our first trip was uh, was to Bergen, Norway. Wow. We went to Trondheim and uh, <laughs> Oslo. Yeah. You know, just like wow. Don't put out a record in the fall. <laughs> you you know, we were chatting uh, <laughs> before the interview started, and you said. Uh, something interesting and, and kind of funny how so many bands that opened for you actually went on to yeah. big superstardom. Yeah, a whole bunch of them. Yeah, it's, so it's name like, a few. Well, the Soul of Silent for right. one. Um, there was uh, County Crows. There was, uh, um, well, the Out of the Squeeze was Crowded House. You know, they, they, the Crowded right. House opened for us. Uh, Dwight Yoakam. Wow. Yeah, when he was still doing kind of like almost like a rockabilly kind right. of thing. Uh, boy, the list kind of goes on and on. I, I can't, I can't even uh, tell you the, um, how many. I mean, I, you know, we could post a list up about them later on. Right. But it's really kind of interesting. You know? Well, you, yeah. besides, uh, you know, touring pretty much nonstop for forty-five years, and one of the most American bands, and I'm, I'm not going to say rock band because you guys, your your music really. It's a code of many colors. There's a lot of different influences mm -hmm. in the styles you play, but you're one of the most durable and most well-loved 
uh, you know, bands in this country and you're loved around the world. And so as you went out there and started to find your audience and see it grow, then you got to play some cool shows. With, you guys got to play some cool shows. Bob Dylan, The Grateful yeah. Dead. Talk about some of those, uh, some of your favorite experiences with oh, the, yeah. the artists you admired that you got to play sure. with. Sure, there, there's, a, there's a, a whole sp spectrum of, of, of feelings about that because once once you become kind of popular, and we, and we did, and we were more kind of like a musician's kind of band right. to begin with. Um, and the writers loved you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, um, As well they should. Sure. Uh, so what happens is that there's a band a member or, or a band discovers you and they really like you and so so uh, they get this idea I really want them to open for us right without really kind of thinking about what the audience might right think. right right so uh -oh. so Huey Lewis <laughs> calls us up and says he wants us open for him at the Oakland Coliseum when he was huge right and we went out there and man they wanted to have nothing to do with us <laughs> yeah <laughs> We did a thing with motels, it wasn't so bad. They were really big, and we did the thing at the Long Beach Arena, and it was kind of lukewarm. But some of them really didn't go real well. Right. But after a while, um, once people really kind of understood, and people kind of knew who we were after a while, um, we opened ZZ Top, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And um, Bob Dylan was a really cool thing. We went down to, we went down to Mexico and did a, a tour of Mexico with them, which wow. was really unusual. And then we did some shows in the U.S. Grateful Dead, that was a real experience. Yeah. Because well, Garcia loved you guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. And sat in with you several times. Yeah, absolutely. That's how we first met him. Yeah. We were playing in a, a place up in, uh, in um, uh, somewhere in the Bay Area. I forget where it was. Oh, up around Mer 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 Marin County. And he showed up with Carlos Santana. Wow. Well, Carlos Santana had brought him. Because Carlos had, had been in contact with us. And then uh, uh, he... he um, uh, he, 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 he dug us and so he brought Jerry with him that night and they both went up on stage and played with us cool. and, and it's it, you can find it on YouTube it's right. a weird grainy little clip but uh, um, that was a real experience with mm -hmm. that, that's a real memorable was being inside of the Grateful Dead experience right being like not just seeing it but being in the inside of it right. it's really and really a, a amazing thing yeah not to mention that the, the you know he was, they were playing uh, multiple nights at sold out stadiums right 55 a, a 60, family of 60,000 people, people are there yes. night after night yes yeah. it was in, it was incredible <laughs> to see that that happen right the, the whole dynamic of it and and rolling into town and some of some of these towns were were 60,000 people would caravan in there well wow. And take over the entire town, right. and the whole town would 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 it would take about a week later to get rid of them all. Right. <laughs> right. It was a lot of fun, and right. we had a really good time with them. Well, you know the, the old joke: uh, How do you know if a deadhead stayed at your house? He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. yeah. But uh, did you, did you ever get a chance to play with? I I imagine you did. My favorite. I think my favorite band in the world was the Neville Brothers. Oh yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you get a chance to play with yeah, those guys? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we 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 would go play Northern uh, Northern Jazz Fest, which is one of the best, if not the best, uh, right. uh, festival in the world. You know, and you know, you know Glastonbury. You know, of course, just right. because of numbers, the, Europe never got over Woodstock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Glastonbury, they still have like five, six hundred thousand right. people at Glastonbury. You played with Glastonbury, it's incredible. No. And then in, in the 90s, then you did Colossal Head uh -huh. and This Time. So that was almost like another uh, reiteration of Los Lobos. That actually you... started after at, uh, when we did Kiko. That was, oh. became a, brand, a whole new chapter. Yeah. You know, when, when uh, we met Mitchell Froom, who produced those records, it was. Uh, um, there's three of them. It was uh, Kiko, uh, Colossal Head, and This Time. Mm -hmm. Those the three records that him and um, and Chad Blake um, uh, injured and, and produced. Uh, we met him because he produced the single version of La Bama, which became the hit. Right. That's how we, we met him. He went on to produce Crowded House. Yeah. And they became huge. So we're both of us. Well, the band and he and Mitch and Chad were both coming off this, you know, mega 
hit records of around you know big the worldwide hit right yeah and we're all kind of trying to figure out like what do we do now well uh, we, you know it was kind of weird because when you have that kind of success it did you, you you go through kind of like an identity crisis mm -hmm. especially when you do something like La Bama which is not really us even though right. you know we, we we're really proud of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, exposing the, the whole legacy of Richie Valens but still it's not us it's uh, um, at its outgrowth of that, we did a, a, a record that really kind of derailed it. It was a traditional record of Mexican music, mm -hmm. which went on to win a Grammy. And then after that, that's when we uh, we got connected with Mitchell, and then we both were kind of n not knowing what to do next. And we all went to the studio, and and Kiko happened, which right. was the, the record that kind of kind of made itself. Right. And that was a real, and so that started a new chapter. And, and a lot of people weren't too sure about that. When Kiko first came out, it baffled a lot of people because it was sonically challenging. It, the the um, I, I kind of threw out the whole formulaic uh, formulaic right. uh, uh, songwriting thing, and we just broke it all apart. We just exploded into different pieces, and then we reassembled it. And in, in in it's like. Uh, a, a jigsaw puzzle puzzle that's supposed to be like a, a puppy in it and, and you put it together and it comes out a giraffe <laughs> 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 or a rhinoceros or something that's what right. we ended up with well, so, and Masi Mas just has so much power behind it and you yeah. were saying that you from those punk roots when when you were in LA I did you guys tap into that then at that point because that's when you're I think you're, you're loud, loudest and rowdiest yeah on those albums yeah that, of those that that colossal head was like the riff record because everything was based on riffs instead of just, you you know like you know three or four chord right. songs, uh, so that was a riff based record and and a lot of it was uh, initiated by David because he was going through a big ZZ Top phase, and so a lot of that influenced that and you know I just went with it and we, and Masi Mas is one of those and well Lou I know you got to play tonight we're really looking forward to the fun. show thank you thank this you is this. no yeah. you know what I've been such a fan of yours since. 1982 that night uh, at 7th Street with 30 of my closest friends <laughs> but you've been in it now with the band for 45 years yeah. a professional musician for 45 yeah. years and songwriter for longer than yeah that. yeah and, and I started writing songs when we were in and school. that's like you know that's like 90 years in an easier profession yeah what 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 keeps you inspired and what keeps you going what are the what what are some of your tricks you know, I, um, I think, uh, well, I think the band dynamic kind of adds to it. It kind of taught me a, a certain kind of, a, 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 an undisciplined discipline. Does mm -hmm. it make any sense? Sure, yeah. Um, because uh, for some reason, and I think a lot of it has to do uh, with our roots together and all the different influences we all have and how they all kind of come together somehow right. on, a, on a record. and. Uh, uh, I think that um, Steve says we, you know, we, it's it's just stave off boredom. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that sure that has something to do with it. I'll tell you some, and it's one of these things. And and, and sometimes so, so some journalists, people I talk to, are a little bit disappointed with the censor, is because I don't have one. It, it's because, <laughs> yeah. because it's like when you're up in an airplane at thirty-five thousand feet, you don't want to talk about what keeps it up. Right. So, yeah. so all I know is that that's we actually a great it. answer. But keep going. And every time, every time we make a record, it's never like the, the we keep in reinventing ourselves, right. and we're still interested, and we're still, dare I say, enthusiastic yeah. about it. And that every time we come to a record, we're, we're um, it, it seems like it's something brand new instead of repeating ourselves. Right. I mean, it's it's not like we willfully say we're going to be different. It just happens. Right. I don't know what it is. Uh, well, a friend um, coins the term. Uh, paralysis through analysis yeah so whenever you're like trying to pick it all apart it's like then you're not getting anything done you're so not getting that, you're just too going, much thinking about it so you're just doing but you know the thing is is really I mean I think you admit you you guys were all born to do it most musicians are born to do it and plus you get to be our age we're too old to join the FBI it's, well we're too yeah <laughs> we're unemployed what else is yeah, exactly. you know we can't we can't dance you know we, you know, we could play an instrument and that's about it but uh, um, just to add to this uh, um, th there's another thing that's going on now we just we just finished a, a recording a Christmas record which has been kind of chasing us around for a while Rhino Records decided that they were gonna they wanted to, to back that 
and uh, we didn't expect it to, to happen anytime soon. Right. And it just fell in our laps and they, uh, sometime in the spring. And then they, uh, we asked, well, when do you want it done? Uh, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so we recorded 13 songs in 15 days. Nice. Is wild. And we were, and David and I wrote an original one. Nice. So it, you can actually go go to um, our website or uh, just put in Los Lobos uh, Christmas record and stuff comes out. It was just announced yesterday. That's it's a real interesting record. So it's uh, Christmas songs from around Latin America. So you're not going to hear Jingle Bells, which I thought would be kind of cool. To right. Kind of Tex-Mex version of that. Right. Or do some kind of spin on it. But but um, it's going to be that one. And then there's the, the which is... A, the, not really a secret, but we're, we're making another one too in November. Beautiful. Another record. I've got a, a personal thing as being such a big fan of Los Lobos and all you guys individually and collectively as a band. I would love to hear you get back on the traps again and play some oh, drums. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, love what, I love your drumming. Yeah, it, you know, again, it's that kind of, it's almost like a, the punk rock uh, aesthetic. Um, um, for one thing, we've been together for 10 years, and we're not going to put out a, 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 a classified ad, like I mentioned earlier, right. for a drummer. So we said, said, well, we'll just make one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So uh, so I, 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 um, I put down the guitar and started with the, you know, playing drums for a good 10, 12 years I did that. Mm -hmm. And then when I got back to guitar, it was a weird thing. It was Arrested Development. Like right. my, my guitar playing was from, like, it's still to this day, is back in, like, 1973. An interesting thing happened. I didn't kind of think about it, and it's a, a collection of um, uh, drawings and a hundred song lyrics and some commentary and an interview and and interviews from Dave Alvin about songwriting, nice. about um, uh, another gentleman by the name of um, um, Luis Rodriguez writes about the writing stuff and then. There are a lot of different facets, kind of all broken up and kind of right. analyzed, and not not of any kind of academic kind of way. So that's that's a book, and it's on. It's been out since uh, last Christmas, and it's on Amazon. Or or and all the proceeds go to go to charity. By the way. Oh, nice. The the the, the um, publishing company is called Tia Chucha Press, and they do wonderful things for the community in in, um, in the San Fernando Valley in, in Los Angeles. Fantastic. So all the proceeds go to them. And you can go directly to their website, and I'll encourage you to do that, tiachucha.org, or just tiachucha, however you want to find it. They That way they get 100% of the... Nice. Because you go to Amazon. And, right. And, you know, I love Amazon, but, you know, they need to take right. that. Right. It's, it's a really cool, cool thing. I'm, I'm really glad. I never expected to do something like this, but it's, it's very cool. So go out and get it. <laughs> Louis, thank you so much for your time. I can't wait to, uh, it's been a few years since I've seen you, I can't wait to hear the whole band in action. Yeah. And I just Tonight is our, this is our 45th anniversary show that we've been doing since the spring. Uh, it's uh, half traditional nice. uh, um, Latin American music, and then we take a break, and then it's uh, uh, rock and roll. So it's 45, 45, 45 yeah. of, of traditional music. And 45 rock and roll. We were trying to convince them to let us have a 45 minute intermission with you. <laughs> <laughs> Not like the old days, right? <laughs> right. Well, Louis, uh, thank you yeah. so much it's for your time. It's been a real, a real pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Good conversation. Yeah, Appreciate man. It. Good luck with everything. And get a little bit of this beautiful sunshine for the show night. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. gorgeous. Well, you know, for musicians, for musicians, daylight is usually dead. <laughs> uh, Thanks so much for watching. I had a most enjoyable time talking to Louis Perez from Los Lobos. And I think uh, one thing you've learned from this conversation is the wolf did survive. And kids don't try this at home. <laughs> it's been really great talking to you on uh, Wall of Power. And good luck with everything. And I look forward to seeing this. Thanks, Louis. All right. Thank all you. Right. And we'll see you all next week. Same time, same station. We'll save you a seat.